John's Gospel, chapter 20. We ended last week with the burial of Christ. We ended last week with the picture of Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, these very well-to-do prominent men in Israel. We know that Nicodemus, we were told, in the beginning of John's Gospel, in John chapter 3, the Lord calls Nicodemus the teacher of Israel, which means he was one of the most prominent teachers of his time. And that if there was anyone that was to know what the Scripture says regarding the coming of the Messiah, it should have been and would have been Nicodemus. Now Nicodemus would come to him and he would say things like, We know that you are a teacher come from God. But nobody can do the things that you do unless they've come from God. But he added a little bit backwards. He was a teacher come from God. And he was right. But he was more than that. The Lord was more than that. He was God coming to teach. And Joseph of Arimathea, this incredibly rich man, rich enough to have chiseled out of the side of a mountain his own tomb and a tomb for his family. Isaiah 53 says he said he would be buried with the rich at his death. Joseph of Arimathea was incredibly powerful. He was somebody who had some influence in the community. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. And these two men, these two men, affected by the life and the person of Christ. So much so that they didn't care about not being able to partake in the Passover. They didn't care that they would have themselves defiled by touching a dead body. They were going to remove the body of Christ from the cross. And they were going to care for him. And they were going to take him and lay him into the tomb of Joseph. For many people, for every, let me just say this. Let me, let me go so far as to say for everybody else in the world, the story ends there. Your biography and my biography ends with, and they died. That's it. The biography of every person in the world since the dawn of time, since the creation of the cosmos, the cosmos since the creation of the earth, Every ending to every story ends the same way. And they died. We die. <laughs> That's it. After that is the judgment. It's determined for man once to die. And then what? The judgment. That's it. You know, we hear oftentimes the, the mantra, the kind of, you know, we hear the, you know, we all have our little proverbs that we listen to and people have their sayings and wise sayings among people and whatever else, right? But you ever hear the one, you only live once, you only get one go around? And generally speaking, that's kind of a heathen mantra. You know, you get one go around, get everything you can out of this life. You're not here for a long time, you're here for a good time. Yeah, we all heard that one, right? You get one go around, you get kind of one, you get one shot at this life. And in many ways, that's true. For many of us, this is it, man. You get one shot in this age. And what happens here has a direct result on what happens after here. And for many, many people, think of it. The billions and billions of people who have lived since the time of creation. The billions and billions of people who have lived, have been born, come into this world the same way that every other person comes in. The end of the story is, they died. There are memorials all over the world. Everywhere we go. We all have loved ones. We all know people who have passed on. We all go visit. Every once in a while, we'll go visit those memorials. Maybe a generation or two, that stops. That stops. Maybe if you're lucky, 
you might get your grandkids to go visit your memorial. If you're lucky. Your kids will. Maybe around your birthday. Maybe around some sort of special event. They'll go visit your memorial. But if you're lucky, maybe your grandkids, maybe you were just a really great grandparent who loved their grandkids. And then they'll go, they may, they may go visit and just leave some flowers by the memorial or say a prayer and, or whatever. They'll just go and just kind of reminisce at your own memorial. But you realize that that's it. Your, your great grandkids probably won't. Unless you've done some like, you know, unless you've done some massive work and there's this massive monument built in your name. But it's not going to be. For most of us here, that's just not going to happen. They're not going to name a hall after you or a building after you or a street after you. For most of us, we're just going to, we're going to live and we're going to die. And maybe if we're lucky, a couple of generations, one, possibly two, will remember us. They'll have some pictures. Think of us, fond memories of us. And then the scrapbook will close. The photo album will close. They're going to get in the cars and they're going to leave that memorial of you and move on with their lives. And your body will remain in the ground. Until now. Until now. This is the most significant event in world history. <laughs> Listen, God can do many amazing things in your life. He set us all free from the power and the penalty of sin. It is, in fact, the double cure. Christ is that. But this is the most significant event in the history of mankind. Do you understand that? There is nothing else greater that has ever happened. There is no other message that is better than this event. Nothing else. Listen, if you don't get anything from this message today, you have to understand that what we believe there is no greater miracle. I don't care what you've been struggling with in your life, what the Lord has set you free from, and how he's repaired your life, your mind, your marriage, what he set you free from by way of bondage of sin. All of those things are wonderful things that the Lord has done to you and to me. Unbelievable miracles. He's healed marriages, man. He's healed frames, bodies. Everything that he's ever done in this world to you and for you takes a second seat, takes a back seat to this event. Every miraculous work that he performed, walking on water, calming the sea, raising Lazarus from the dead, everything else plays second fiddle to this event. This event. We dismiss it. We've heard the story so many times. We have. We've heard this so many times. It, it can almost be watered down. We've heard it so many times. We can sometimes, we can just grow numb to this, the reality of this. Because it's just, it's part of our orthodoxy, isn't it? I mean, this is what we truly believe. And this is, the, this is what the body of Christ believes in. This is, I mean, we can, we've heard it so much. We've, we've preached it. We remember, we read on it. I mean, we just, we've gone through the, the empty tomb. How many Easter's have we celebrated this? I mean, think of it. How many times have we dressed the kids up and, you know, you come together in church and everybody gets all dolled up for Easter. I even do it once a year. You know, you just, you, know, you come together and you, you know, how many times have we celebrated this? We think about it. And we, we praise the Lord for it. It's in our songs. But it's almost as if we can, you know, we hear about this and we get so just, I don't want to say infected by it, but there's no other word I can think of right now because my vocabulary is kind of junk. But listen, this, we get so kind of like overwhelmed with the thought and it just kind of, we can very easily dismiss it because so ingrained in our orthodoxy and what we believe as Christians that we sometimes just pass over it. We sometimes don't even really pay it much mind. Sometimes we'll praise the Lord even more so for the littler things that he does in our lives I mean, most of us really, I mean, think of it. 
So there are those times in our own lives we praise God for, you know, the freedom that we now have in Christ. We praise Him for the power that we now have through the Holy Spirit. We praise Him for the marriage that we have, the children that we have. We praise Him for all of these things. And sometimes we forget to really praise the Lord for this event. This event. Billions and billions of graves are still full. And if the Lord waits to take us home, your grave will be full too. There's only one. <laughs> one. One grave in the world right now. One. One tomb in the world that's empty. Only one. Last week, we talked about how the Lord has had some special moments with his disciples and special moments with those who followed him. He had some special moments with Peter, special moments with John, special moments with Joseph of Arimathea, special moments with Nicodemus. He has special moments with me, special moments with you. Things that not many people would really truly understand. I mean, there's, there's ways that the Lord has, things that the Lord has done in you and with you and moments that you've had with Christ that not many people would really fully understand. Personal things. I mean, people understand lots of supernatural, miraculous things, but there are personal things that the Lord has moments in time that He's had with you. Miracles that only you would truly fully understand the brevity of. Personal relationship that he's grown with you. And we see another one here. <clears throat> it says now, in verse 1, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Now listen, this woman, Mary Magdalene, much, much controversy, discussion, theory over who she is. Some believe that she was the woman, the adulterous woman who was saved from Christ by being stoned, from being stoned. The woman who was caught in the very act of adultery. Some believe that she was the adulterous woman, the woman of sin, who would anoint the feet of Christ with her own hair, I don't know if she's any of those things, either of those things. I don't believe so. All we know is that in the gospel accounts, Mary Magdalene is the first woman mentioned in every one of these accounts. Not even Mary, the mother of Christ. She's the one that's put in front for us to see. She's this personality is, is the one that's really been given kind of the preeminence in this particular scripture. The one who sticks out. The one who the Lord mentioned in all four Gospels. The one whose response to the empty tomb is recorded for us. And she was clearly a disciple of Christ. She followed him. In fact, the Bible tells us she was the first one there, man. And she wasn't alone. You read the other gospel accounts, there were other, there were other Marys <laughs> with her. A couple of other different Marys. And the name was Miriam, okay? A couple, of other, a couple of other ladies would go to the tomb hoping to see the body of Christ and anoint his body. 
but the tomb was closed. They got there and the tomb's closed. It was put, a, a seal was put around it, the Roman seal. The Pharisees and, and uh, Pontius Pilate would come together and they would devise a plan to make sure that nobody would go into the tomb and steal the body of Christ. So he would put a seal over it. And then he would put a Roman guard, a Roman garrison there to guard the tomb to make sure that nobody would go in, roll the stone away, and pull out the body of Christ. But the other Gospels tell us a very interesting story about what happened. There was an earthquake. And an angel descends from heaven. Pushes the stone right out of the way. The Roman soldiers fall down like dead men. Scared to death. These men, it took a lot to scare them. They were highly trained. These men were scared to death. What they saw, what they heard... And they take off running. Tough guys. They take off running. The stone gets pushed out of the way. And the gospel accounts tell us that the angel sat on top of that stone. I dig that. I really dig that picture. You get the picture of this kind of angel. just kind of moving the stone out of the way. Just sitting down on it. Saying, yep. Be gone. He sits down. And this woman, Mary, comes. And she's looking for a dead Jesus. She comes expecting to see a dead Jesus. She comes expecting to see her friend and anoint his body. But that's not what she finds. She finds an empty tomb and she takes off. And she tells those who are closest to Christ. She does the right thing. She's not going to go telling anybody else. She's going to go telling the friends of Jesus. They took him away. <laughs> who? Who took him away? They. They took him away. And she's freaking out. She's losing her mind. Where did he go? Where is the body of my Savior? Now listen. Listen. This woman has an incredible interaction here. This woman goes and she runs back to tell <laughs> the disciples that the body of Christ is gone. Now listen, watch this. I'm gonna, we're going to get into her in a second. And then it says, Peter, in verse 3, Peter therefore went out and the other disciple, that was John, and were going to the tomb. Now listen, in verse 2 it says, she ran. And then in verse 4 it says, then they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. I love this verse. Outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, that's John, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying there, yet he did not go in. Now listen, I really dig this because John, at like 90-something years old, thinks enough in his mind to just input a little bit, knowing that his words are going to be etched in eternity. I love this about this guy. Goes, oh yeah, by the way, I outran Peter. <laughs> I love it. Knowing that his word, listen, you understand that this is the eternal word? You get that? We're going to be reading that forever. And it's almost as if he was the last disciple to die, and he, and he knew it. And he knew he was going to be the last one putting this together. But <laughs> I outran Peter. <laughs> and you're going to be a guy to kind of understand that. At 90-something years old, I would probably be putting that in there too. Little zinger to the great apostle Peter. Big tough guy. But I do think that there's a, there's a more pertinent reason that's here. I think that the Holy Spirit and everybody else reading this all of those who would read this that John is writing to, all the members of the church that would read this letter, they want to know from John that Peter didn't, Peter didn't get there before him to remove the body. He saw himself that the tomb was empty. And he saw it first. He was there and saw it first. That which we have seen which we have touched, which we have heard, John would say. He wanted everybody to know that he was an eyewitness first, that that tomb was empty. And they both ran together. And the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. 
And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying there, yet he did not go in. Now, there's probably a couple of reasons why he didn't go in. Number one, he was probably a little creeped out. I would be. It's a dark tomb, man. And you're looking for your friend who is supposed to be in there, and he's not. And then we see Simon Peter, never to disappoint. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen clothes lying there, and a handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the other linen cloths, but folded together in a pile by itself. Now listen, I want you to note that for a second. And there's a reason. Because if grave robbers went in there to steal the body of Christ for whatever reason, they wouldn't take the time to make it neat. You ever been in a house that's been broken into? I have. They don't really take the time to put things back where they're supposed to go, if you haven't noticed that. They ransack the place. They destroy the place. Number one. Number two, why would they leave the grave clothes behind anyway? The Lord wants us to see that he came out from the bonds he came out from the bonds. The handkerchief that tied his head together that would close his mouth was folded neatly to let everybody know that this was done on purpose. There was no mistake. No grave robber came in to steal the body of Christ. Peter defiles himself walking into this place. Probably pushed John out of the way. You think you're so fast. Boom, give him a hip check gets into the tomb. Then John goes in afterwards. Now they're both defiled. And they don't care. Something has happened. The world, from this point on, will never, ever be the same. Something's happened. Everything that he's been saying up until this point has come true. The tomb is empty. He has been raised from the dead. He is the firstborn above and beyond all creation. The very first one to experience that, and they witness it. Now, you would think that such a mind-blowing event, what would that do to you? I mean, what would that do to me? You would think that such a mind-blowing event would cause them to leave that place, go out into the world, and start telling everybody, he's gone, he's gone, the tomb is empty. Kind of like Paul Revere. The British are coming, you know, just riding around. You'd think that he would just grab a donkey or a camel or a horse or something, have John pull him on a rickshaw. He's gone! He's empty. The tomb is empty. You would think that he would be announcing this from the rooftops. <laughs> then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also and saw and believed. For as yet he did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples, look at this, went away again into their own homes. Upon the reality that life has been changed forever. Everything that they knew about Christ had come true. They knew what he said. They just didn't really know the scriptures to back up what he said. They knew what happened. And upon learning of this insurmountable reality, they go home. Wow, this is amazing. I wonder what my honey is cooking for lunch. I got to go eat breakfast. I'll be right back. This is where they go. Listen, this is such a guy reaction too, by the way. Wow, that's cool. Unbelievable, isn't it? Leave it to a woman to understand the brevity of what just happened. She leaves and goes and tells him, says, he's gone, he's gone. And they say, no, sir. They go into the tomb. They kick the door open. It's already open. Peter goes in, all bold and brash. John goes in after him. And they look at each other and say, huh. <laughs> what do you know? 
Let me go home. (laughs) But Mary, it says in verse 11, but Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And it is an interesting picture. I don't really go far into this. I mean, there are some teachers who believe that it's a picture of the Ark of the Covenant and the, the mercy seat. You see the cherubim sitting at either end. and It teaches, but I'm not really sure that it's theologically applicable. All you see is two angels sitting there, one at the head and one at the feet. The atonement was made on the cross. And we're going to get into that. Because as we see, as we're going to read, he's going to say, don't cling to me, don't cleave to me. And there are some teachers who would take that to say that, you know, he couldn't be touched by her because he had to go ascend into heaven. He had to sprinkle some blood on some mercy seat that was in the temple in heaven. And then he could be touched after that. The Bible doesn't say anything about that. The atonement was made on the cross. Payment was made on the cross. The blood that was spilled is where atonement was made. So he didn't have to go and make any special atonement to some sort of temple in heaven. But in either case, she sees a couple of angels. Now listen, she sees the angels. The guys don't. She sees these two angels because she stayed just a bit longer. And sometimes the best way to see God is through tears. Sometimes the best way to see the work of God is through tears. She's weeping, man. And the Bible, again, I say this all the time, the Bible doesn't exaggerate, and I say that all the time. I love that about the Word of God. Every once in a while, you'll read something like they were wailing aloud. This word in the Greek means she was doing that very thing. She was convulsing. She was weeping. She couldn't even barely hold on to herself. She was losing control. And listen, by the way, in the Middle East, we don't know much about this here in Westernized culture, but in the Middle East, weeping is an event. When someone dies in the Middle East, weeping, it's a profession, but it's an event. It is extroverted. There is no internal weeping. There is no sucking it back. None of that. In the Middle East, it is all sorts of whistling and all sorts of yelling and and they go... I mean, they are weeping, and they want everybody to know that they're weeping. And you do. And she was convulsing. And she wanted everybody to know, within probably a good mile radius, that she was doing that very thing. Because she was sad. Why? Why was she so sad? Why was she so broken up about this? It shouldn't take a lot to understand. Listen, have you ever lost someone so close to you? Think about that for a second. I want you to just put yourself in this story. She doesn't yet know what's going on with Jesus. The disciples don't even really know what's going on. She, all she knows is that he's gone. He's dead. His body's gone. She's got no closure, man. The last image she saw of Christ, he was hanging on the cross, getting a spear thrust into his side. These two men carried him off. He was beaten bloody. His form, his visage marred more than any man. He looked like an animal. And she missed him. She missed her friend. She loved Jesus. She loved him. She loved him and she was working so diligent. She was so upset and she was trying so hard to see a dead Jesus and she couldn't find him. And she missed him. She missed his life. Do you understand that this was the effect that the Lord has on people? This was the effect that the Lord had on people then. He was a gentleman. He was a gentle soul. He was the Lamb of God. He was approachable. He would talk to people that were outcasts, man. He would conversate with people who were disgusting. He would make people feel welcome. 
He'd make them feel like a million bucks when the rest of the world was kicking them to the curb. He would heal families. He would cleanse lepers. This was his heart. And their response is this. Again, I, maybe I'm the only one that finds humor in this. I, I don't know. I read this, and this is funny. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Look at There isn't a guy on this planet that can get away with saying that. But you have these two angelic Mr. Sparks. Why are you weeping? Why are you crying? And we know from the other Gospels what they say to her. Why do you seek the living among the dead? For he is risen. He's not, he's not here. So, why are you crying? See, to angels, this is the miraculous and the supernatural is where they live. You understand? Their faith is sight. They don't have the faith that we have. They don't have the access to God by faith that we have. This is why angels could never be saved. This is why fallen angels don't have a second shot. They've seen God. They've seen in all His glory. They've seen all the miraculous works. The wonders of heaven have been revealed to them. They don't know what it takes to have faith that we have. They have no idea what the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is like. First Peter tells us that the salvation that we actually have, angels desire to look into. They're still figuring it out. Why are you crying? That's a dude answer too. I don't understand this. What is it? You know, we can be so insensitive. But listen, by the way, that's a gift sometimes. It can be a curse, but it can be a gift. Sometimes, listen, ladies, sometimes you need to have a blockheaded dude who's just, you know, just really, really difficult to turn, a really stiff-necked guy who's just going to, you know, be, be what God's called them to be and just keep moving forward. It works sometimes in your favor. Sometimes it can be a little confusing. Why are you weeping? I mean, I don't even understand why you're crying. What is it? I don't get it. <laughs> These angels, why are you crying? Why are you weeping? Why are you cleal? Why are you convulsing? That's the Greek word. It means convulsing. And she said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now, when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Now, it's amazing to me that the Lord has done this on a couple of occasions. He doesn't yet reveal to her who he is. He's in a glorified state. And he did this again with the men on the road to Emmaus. They had no idea who they were walking with until he opened up the scripture and revealed to them who he was and taught them that the Messiah must be crucified, die, and raise again on the third day. I mean, I wish I really could have gotten in on that Bible study. But she doesn't know it's him. Now listen, there could be a number of reasons. Number one, he's probably hiding it from her for a good minute. And there's some biblical precedent for this. Going all the way back, all the way back, you do a Bible study, go all the way back to the very beginning into Genesis 45. And what do you see when you see the type of Christ in Joseph? You see this type of Christ in Joseph before he reveals himself to his brothers. He's standing before his brothers who betrayed him. He's standing before his brothers who sold him off into slavery. He's standing before his brothers who hated him, wanted to kill him, but then somehow or another managed to come together in this weird deal to kind of you know, send him off. Sell him off. Having all the power, having all the opportunity to kill his entire family. Joseph stands there in his Egyptian garb, speaking to them, by the way, in Arabic, in Egyptian, with a translator. And he wants to just test their hearts a little bit. And Judah finally speaks up and tells them, tells Joseph what's gone on with his family, what's gone on with his father. 
admits that they sold their brother off into slavery. Sticks up for Benjamin. Stands in the gap for Benjamin. And then after Joseph sees that there's been a heart change. Listen, you have to put yourself in the story. It's such an amazing story. You know I still can't read it to this day without tearing up? (laughs) After Joseph sees that his brothers, their hearts have changed, he tells, yells at everybody, everybody, get out. Get out! Clears the room. Only him and his brothers remain. And you can almost picture this in your mind. He has all of this Egyptian jewelry on. He's got makeup on. He's got headgear on. He's got all these things disguising him. He doesn't look anything like the man that they knew or the boy that they knew or they remembered. And Joseph goes, and you can almost see him just kind of whipping off his earrings and pulling off his gold and just kind of rubbing the eye makeup out and taking off the headdress. And he says, he goes, it's me. Joseph. And they were scared to death. Don't take my word for it. Then Joseph couldn't restrain himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out. Make everyone go out from me. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud. And the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard it. And then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near to me. So they came near. And then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now, do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years, the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will neither be plowing nor harvesting, and God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the great and to save your lives by great deliverance. What a wonderful story. And he waits. He waits to reveal. He waits to reveal to Mary. And he says, Woman, why are you weeping? Why are you weeping? Who are you seeking in verse 15? Why are you weeping? Who are you seeking? What's going on with you? And she, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried away, if you have carried him away, tell me. Tell me where you have laid him. And I will take him away. It's often... It should be mentioned anyway. That if you've ever been to this degree of sorrow, if you've been ever engaged in this degree of wailing and weeping and moaning and crying and just overwhelmed with emotion and your face is just falling apart, you can't even barely hang on. Your whole body is, is convulsing over the news, over an event We've all been there, every one of us. We've all been there to the point where we are wailing and weeping and losing control. And you don't even see right. You're not looking at anybody in their face. You can barely lift your head. She probably thinks it is the gardener. She's probably not even looking. Not looking directly at him. She's distracted. She's completely overcome by emotion. She's overwhelmed by the news. And she's sad. And all she hears is, Woman, why are you weeping? Why are you weeping? Why is she so sad? Do you know who she was? Listen, do you know who the Bible says she is? You read Luke chapter 8. Look at 
Luke chapter 8 and Mark 16 tell us exactly who she was. She was a woman who had been set free from seven demons. This was a woman through who knows, who knows how this happens. No one really knows how demonic possession actually takes place. All we know is that it happens. Who knows what happened in her life? Who knows what she engaged in? Who knows how demons became present in her body? All we do know is that when that happens, it's torturous. When that happens, it is insanely torturous. Demons don't possess a person because they like them. They possess a person because they hate them. Because we are the image bearers of God. Demons don't possess a person because they want to bless them. Demons possess a person because they want to curse them and torture them. We know this. You read the Bibles. What happened? You read the Bible. What did Jesus do when he came upon the madman of Gadara? They come running up on him. They would cut themselves. They would torture themselves. They would cry out in pain all night long. They were insane, these two men, living in tombs, living among the dead. Demons, they're brutally brutally evil and who knows how many times in her life she wanted to cry out who knows how many times from the inside of that being caught in a shell that she had no control over she wanted to cry out how many times she would go to cry out or talk try to talk to somebody and who knows what was met behind that she would try to say something and she was cut off by a demon one of seven She met Jesus. She met Jesus. And he cleansed her. The same way he cast out the demons from the madman at Gadara. Same way. And she loved Jesus because of that. She was just happy knowing Jesus. He was her friend. He was the one who set her free. And she was just happy knowing that. Listen, how many of us forget that? How many of us often have to say to the Lord, restore to me, O God, the joy of my salvation? Because we forget that. We start to look at ministry as if it's something to, to take hold of. We start to look at walking, walking with Christ as if he owes us something. And very few of us remember that we should just be happy knowing Jesus. Knowing that he knows you and that you now have a peace with God, according to Romans 5.1. That you've been justified in the Spirit. You now have peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And how many of us just forget that? That's not enough. It's not enough. Yeah, I'm saved. I'm born again. La di da. Great. Now what I want you to do is I need money. I need a position in the church. What I need is I need some sort of validation. I want a great wife or a great husband. I want kids. I don't want kids. I don't want to serve. I don't want to serve doing that. I don't want to serve doing this. I want to do this for the Lord. I don't want to do that for the Lord. Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? Why have you done this to me? Why have you done this? Am I cursed? We go through our lives, we just start thinking about, you know, what the Lord has done, what He hasn't done. And we get so caught up and forgetting about who He is and enjoying that. Enjoying that we're not owed. We're, no, we are not owed any salvation. We're not owed the grace. Our names are written, written in the Lamb's book of life. And it's only by grace. And we forget that. This woman wanted to go see the body of Christ. She wanted to go see her friend. Why? Because she loved him. Loved him for what he did to her and what he did for her. What he and who he was to her. Do we? Do we? Do we still love Jesus for who he is? Do we? Do we still love Jesus and praise the Lord because our names are written in the Lamb's book of life? Do we? 
Or do we complain still? Oh, Lord, look at what you're doing. Oh, Lord, look at what the pastor's doing. Oh, Lord, look at what the church is doing. Oh, Lord, look at what's going on in the world. Oh, Lord, I got no money. Oh, Lord, da, da, da. we start freaking out. And that's okay. You can freak out. The Lord wants to hear all that too. But how often do we forget what this woman was remembering? She's convulsing. Losing control of her own body because she missed her Savior. She missed her friend. She loved his person. Jesus can sometimes be such a theological exercise. He can. Christianity and following Christ can be such a theological and doctrinal exercise. We say our prayers before we eat. We say our prayers before we go to bed. We make sure we do our devotions in the morning. We make sure we go to church. We make sure we give. We make sure we do all the things that good Christian boys and girls should be doing. It becomes a theological exercise. Rather than remembering the person that right now seated at the right hand of the Father is our King because the work has been finished. And He knows me. He knows you. He knows your name. He knows all the things you think, all the things you say, all the crazy things that go on in your brain all the time. He knows all that stuff. He lives inside you. You can't get around him. He lives inside you, and he knows all the things you struggle with. He knows when you're boiling in your heart against somebody at work, someone in your house, someone in the church. He sees all that ugly stuff that you try to mask up when you come to church, of course. He sees all that ugly stuff that he sees us try to stuff down. And he still meets with you. He still meets with you. He still meets with me. When we're busted up over something that's going on in our life, brokenhearted over some failure, sad about the loss of a loved one, even in the midst of all of our craziness and all of our sin and all of our failures and our weaknesses, the Lord still meets up with us and says, why are you weeping? Who are you seeking, he says. You know, he asked the disciples a very similar question in John chapter 1, a couple of years before this. What do you seek? What do you seek? What does following Christ mean to you? What are you looking for? What do you seek? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. Miriam. Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. One of the last times that word is used in the Bible. Every time the Lord is referenced at the end of this, after this point, he is in ref- it, the, the term is Christ our Lord, the Lord Jesus. Teacher. Master. You have to put yourself in the story. I say it to you all the time. Put yourself in the story. Do you ever have, we, most of us have kids, do you ever see one of your kids totally freaking out over something small? I have. Maybe I'm the only one. Anybody who's got daughters knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> you ever see one of your daughters freaking out? They're losing their mind. They're emotional little people. That's okay. We love them. And they're freaking out. My one, my one daughter, my other daughter, Anna, she's getting right there. My one daughter, Nora, she's five, and she will just freak out sometimes. Small thing. She lost a toy. She lost one of her little stuffed animals. One of her favorites. She'll freak out. I know where it is. She's losing her mind. I say, daughter, sweetheart, what are you freaking out about? It's okay. It's okay. I can only think about what would happen if my daughter 
was looking for me. And I was standing right before her. She didn't recognize me. And she was freaking out. Where is my dad? Where is he? Where is he? Have you seen him? Have you seen my father? Have you seen him? There's only so much more the Lord can take. And he says, Mary. In a way that she knew a familiar word, a familiar name. She knew it. That's her handle, man. That's her handle. And all of a sudden, her eyes are opened. Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. And Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I'm ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came, told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her, to her first. First. The very first person in the world to see the risen Savior and have a conversation with him is this woman, this beautiful, blessed woman who knew Christ, knew who he was, and he was special to her. The apostle to the apostles, so to speak. She goes off and she says, he's alive. The first evangelist, he's alive. something special here the Lord takes a moment and tells her don't cling to me don't cleave to me I'm leaving again but we all know that he never leaves us alone he doesn't leave us orphans he doesn't leave us to go navigating through this life he gives us the church he gives us the body but even more importantly he gives us his own spirit to dwell in us, to sit in us, to minister to us, to teach us, to encourage us, to exhort us, to correct us, to get us back in line, but always, always to minister the best things for us. I wonder, I wonder if our reaction sometimes should be the same as Mary's. Is the Lord still special enough to us to tell people about him? Is he? It's, it's an honest challenge. And don't worry, I'm talking to myself too. Is the Lord still special enough to you? Special enough to me? Is knowing Jesus as important to you now as it was in the beginning of your walk? Is knowing that heaven is your home still something that you treasure? Is that? Is it still something that you hold dear to yourself? Is it still, is it the value of knowing Jesus? Something that's important to you. So important that you can't even contain yourself. That you gotta go tell somebody else about it. The world right now has us incredibly distracted. We are distracted by just about anything and everything. We're all, we think we're intelligent. We're all just a bunch of sheep. We all think we're a bunch of smarty pants. We're not bunch of sheep. Bah. That's all we are. We're led around by the nose, by whatever they put in front of us. And we just believe it. We just suck it all in. We just eat it all up. It's all sorts of conspiracies. And what's going on in the world? And the Democrats are trying to kill us all. We eat it all up. What's going on? It's craziness, madness. We're all going to die. We eat it all up. You wear a mask, idiot. You wear a mask, you don't wear a mask, killer. Let's be honest. Ah, murderer, moron. That's where we are. And we just, we let around by whatever it is that they feed us. 
And we lose sight of what's important. We lose sight of this event, man. This event. We lose sight that there's, that there's an empty tomb still now. You can go there if you want. I've never been. I'm hoping to get there someday. You can go there and you can check it out. You can walk right inside of it. And it's the only one in the world. The only one that's empty. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, Christ our King, our Lord, Savior, Almighty God, so many names, Lord. <clears throat> You're so many things to us. You're such a blessing to each one of us individually, Lord. It's amazing to all of us, Lord. It's amazing. Amazing that you would look upon us, fallen sinners, never once reaching out to God, never once even thinking of the Lord in our old life, never thinking one time of eternity or pleasing God, and yet you stepped into our lives. You cleansed us, released us, Lord, from the power of darkness. Witness to us, Lord, and you gave us life. You translated us that we have crossed over from death into life simply by believing. You loved us. You called us by name. So many things in our life have changed, Lord, as a result of walking with you and knowing you. So many things, Lord, and we know, Lord, that even the difficult times work out for us in the end. So many challenges, so many blessings, so much since we've been walking with you and since we've been learning from you, Lord. There have been so many things. I pray in Jesus' name that all of the experiences, all of the good things and the bad things and all the the crazy things we see happening in the world that can distract us. All of those things would take a back seat to the resurrection, the new life, eternal life. According to your word, we will have a body fashioned unto like your glorious body the firstborn over all creation. Miraculous work. I pray, Lord, that for all of us who feel entitled to something, forgive us in Jesus' name. Forgive us for our sin, our desire to want something that isn't ours, but that we would be content, knowing your word, that godliness with contentment is great gain. Knowing you would be important. We pray in Jesus' name that this truth would never, ever leave. That we would be content knowing that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. That we would be content just knowing you. And because you live, we live with you. I pray, Lord, that if there's anyone here any one person that's here this morning that has never come to this, that has never accepted this, never believed the truth, I pray, Lord, today would be the day that they would. If you're here and you've never prayed to receive Christ or you've prayed it, maybe you, you said some mundane prayer some time before and you never really meant it and you want your relationship with the Lord to be real, if you're here and you want that, you just say this prayer right where you're seat, seated. You can say it in your heart. You can say it out loud but just mean it. Just say, 
Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I need a savior. I believe that you're the son of God sent to take away my sin. Forgive me. I make you Lord of my life from this day forward. In Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, we know that you know who are yours, Lord, according to your word. I pray this morning that each one of us would leave here today changed, challenged, encouraged, knowing, Lord, that we've all heard from you. Bless our time. Receive our worship now as a sacrifice of praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. Let's pray.